Hello everyone, David here, Mixbus TV. Hope you're having a great day. This is the second episode of Mixbus TV Roundtable, the music industry talk show. I'm here with Bob Horn. Hey everybody. My friend, we are here at Echo Bar Studios in Los Angeles. And today we're gonna have, well, me and Bob, of course, Joe Vizzetti and Ma'at Hotep. And we are gonna have Erin Jacobson, the music industry lawyer, and Dai Bogan from Tune Registry. This is the second episode of Mixbus TV's Roundtable, the music industry talk show. Today we have Bob Horn, music engineer. What all would you say you do, Bob? Because uh, I know you do more than that. Mix, engineer, produce, and play instruments. We have David Nazi, yep. metal, but you're more than that. What do you do? Mix engineer and producer, I would say. And I also happen to have a YouTube channel. <laughs> we have Dave Bogan, Tune Registry, I remember you from Tune Registry, and you had Maven, or what was it? Maven Promo. Uh, Maven Promo, yeah, that's yeah. when I first met you. Yeah. Tell us about you. Uh, yeah. I have Tune Registry, which is a music rights administration software, and uh, teach at UCLA, music business, mutual entrepreneurship. All right, and we have last but not least, Aaron Jacobson, music industry lawyer. The music industry lawyer. The music industry <laughs> lawyer, Aaron Jacobson. Yeah. Tell us about you. So I'm, as you said, a music lawyer, and I represent songwriters, composers, artists, producers, managers, music publishers, and I do all the contracts in between all those parties. My practice is very heavy on complex music publishing, legacy catalogs, uh, large-scale music clearance projects, but I also do all the... Recording agreements, producer agreements, mixing, mixer agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So if it's a contract and it's music, I do that. <laughs> okay, our audience yes. is a bunch of our audience who are you guys clients. They're perfect for you guys. Mm. Before they approach you, what? Email me through my website at themusicindustrylawyer.com. Um, tell me what sort of legal issue you need assistance with and... You know, we'll go from there. I'll let you know if it's something I do, I don't do, costs involved, that sort of thing. But usually for someone contacting me, it's either drafting, reviewing, or negotiating a contract. It's uh, registrations, whether that be copyright or to having to do it with songs. And uh, or for legacy catalogs, they have unique issues. So it's usually something with copyright terminations or some of the other unique legacy issues, sometimes catalog purchase and sale. I do a lot of those. So it just, uh, it depends on the client, but it's usually either something with contracts or something with copyright, but I don't do mm -hmm. the infringement lawsuits. Okay. So. And Day, if somebody, what, tell us, what, what somebody wants to contact you, what do they do? And tell us the deal. Yeah, well, a little bit different. Um, we're focusing on uh, music rights administration, so helping uh, rights holders, small to medium size um, uh, rights holders, whether you're independent artists that own your own masters or you're publishing um, or independent label or publishing company. Um, we, we're a software solution, so we should be a part of your overall uh, kind of toolkit for music business. Um, so they come to our website and they create an account and then they can create, you know, upload their, um, or create their catalog. And then through our system, they will do their registrations with music rights organizations, um, to help them streamline the process and have a clarity on, um, how it works for registering works. These, the new laws that have come into play, how does that affect us? The, the, the Music, Music Modernization Act. Act. It doesn't affect anybody yet because it's not actually going into effect till next year. But okay. uh, what the goal is, is that the rates for streaming and downloading, it will be on a blanket mechanical license. And the way those rates are set will be more hopefully more in line with a willing buyer, willing seller standard. So it will be, they will consider what would be these rates if we were in a free marketplace, um, you know, basis for setting those rates. Because previously it's just been, well, how have we set these rates in the past and what have exactly. they been in the past? But now they're going to try and look at it 
as more of a free market scenario, as well as what are the labels getting? Uh, because the labels get quite a bit more, so hopefully that'll level the playing field a bit more. And we are talking yeah. about uh, streaming streaming um, sites, right? Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Spotify mm -hmm. and yeah, all the digital service providers. So basically, the modern, the, the Music Modernization Act. What should change? What should change is hopefully overall industry wide there will be higher payments for streaming for songwriters and publishers. Bo both for artists and for labels. You know, I think it will benefit the industry overall okay. um, for everyone. There's also a bit about, um, I think a lot of your audience is probably producers and yeah, engineers and mixers. That. So yeah. there's an aspect of it that even though there was, you could still get your producer royalty through sound exchange before it kind of solidifies yeah. that. Um, so that's part of it for uh, pre-1972 sound recordings. There's... Um, for the digital performance, there will be royalties for artists on those recordings and labels and whatnot. So, um, so I mean, overall, it is it's a positive thing. Okay. Yeah. And when this should be? Well, it just passed a few months ago. So right now they're setting up. It's actually a lot to get everything in place. They're in process of putting together the board that's going to oversee the licensing. They we don't have a centralized database okay. of all the data in the U.S., so they have to put all that together and create that, and there's different companies that are applying to be the ones that oversee that, uh, so that's in process. So it, it's going to take a little while. But the it's, infrastructure it's, is yeah, not Yeah, the infrastructure yet. is not totally there yet, so we're it's expected by next year, I believe. Uh, I will ask you later about yeah. this too, because we know Erin mm -hmm. is, is her time is limited today. We are gonna we're gonna have you for longer. Um, what is um, one of the questions uh, that I wanted to to go through? Uh, just because our our audience, mm -hmm. as you as you said, are mo more most of them are producer or independent mm -hmm. producers. Mm -hmm. What are the first basic steps? to register a piece, a song, mm -hmm. a track. So it when we say register, there's different aspects of that, yeah. actually. So uh, for from an ownership perspective, that would be registering with the U United States Copyright Office. Okay. And while when you create something, it is copyrighted under the law, when you, what they call, fix it in a tangible medium. It means, you know, record it, write it down, put it in something physical that can be reproduced. It doesn't afford you all the protections that actual registration with mm -hmm. the Copyright Office okay. will. So, um, and it's not expensive to do it um, as far as the fees that the Copyright Office charges. So it's, you get extra benefits. There's a record that, that you're the owner or the author of it. Uh, that you can sue for infringement if there's an issue. There's statutory damages available, which basically means more money if you win an infringement suit. So there are definitely these benefits that you don't get. If there's ever an infringement on your work, you can't do anything unless you have that registration. The registration date is what a court will look at to determine the date of that work. Mm -hmm. So, because a lot of people have said to me, oh, you mail it to yourself or you yeah. post it on YouTube or anything like that. So I call that the poor man's copyright and the poor man's copyright 2.0. Because, yeah, and not mm -hmm. really. I mean, there's, you know, it, it shows something, but a court's not going to really look at it. So they want to see that date on a federal registration certificate. Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, register with Copyright Office. Um, and then as far as royalties, there's different registrations. So there's, uh, on the composition side, uh, one thing that um, is, it's very important, but not a lot of people really uh, know no. necessarily, like, starting out, is that the composition, music and lyrics, and the uh, recording are actually two separate entities legally with that. royalty separate royalty streams as well. So on the composition performance side, that's when you're going to register with ASCAP or BMI. Okay. Um, on the digital performance side for the sound recordings, that's SoundExchange. 
Um, back on the composition side, you have Harry Fox for mechanicals. Of course, there's YouTube for ad rev and, and those types of income streams. So it's actually it's actually not just like one registration and okay, you're done. It, it kind of depends what aspect you're people, and you want to cover all of them. Mo most people are uh, have this impression that it's just mm -hmm. one regis registration. Right. So um, we I, there you mentioned uh, BMI and, uh, mm -hmm. and ASCAP. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are also other independent or other uh, companies, association, let's say? Not really. So there are, so for performance rights organizations in the United States, there's four. There's ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Global Music Rights. CSAC you have to be invited to, and Global Music Rights is more private, and okay. it's for the artists that they work with or the writers that they work with. So for anyone, especially people just starting out, you're going to pick either ASCAP or BMI. They're Which both good. They both did. I get that question all the time. Which should I register with? Which is better? They're both good. They both do the same thing. The application fees vary slightly, um, but it's really just kind of which one you like. You mm -hmm. know, take a look at their websites. Um, maybe some of the artists that you admire are members of one or the other. Um, but at, at the end of the day, they, they perform the same function. They're both good at it. Okay. You know, pick which one you like. Day, um, is your company, uh, Tune Registry, cuts into this, the registration process, the copyright Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the core of our business, is that we interact with all the music rights organizations in North America. Okay. And we deliver and process and, and handle disputes and conflicts of registrations of these types. Um, so, you know, we're on top of what's happening with the MMA. Uh, we were actually intimately involved with that process awesome. um, in a number of ways. Um, in regards to uh, registrations, yeah, it's super important that not only that artists understand that they have to register, register their stuff, but understanding when they should register their stuff. A lot of times, you know, you know they come to us and you already released your music, but it hasn't been properly registered mm -hmm. in anywhere. And that leaves the door open to, you know, missing royalties, you know, okay. unclaimed royalties, yeah. uh, which is another business that I founded that deals with unclaimed royalties and how do you go back and dig back three years and, and, and get money. Um, so it's definitely important to make sure that, um, you know, as an artist or as a producer, you understand all the rights that you have and in, in, in the, in your contributions, um, and how those royalties flow. Mm -hmm. Um, I think most artists that are serious about their career are familiar with ASCAP and BMI and that's sort of where it ends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> They're starting to get a little bit more familiarity, familiarity with, um, um, sound exchange because sound exchange is doing a great job from a marketing standpoint and being very involved in in conferences and stuff um, but then there's not really un under you know they don't really understand what Harry Fox does or music reports which is equally as important as Harry Fox um, and then there's smaller organizations like the AARC which is the Alliance for Artists and Record Companies and AFM SAC AFTRA fund and a bunch of other stuff so it's important to know you know where is your royalties coming from and yeah. how do you position yourself to collect those royalties and that's what we do every single day at tune registry is positioning rights holders whether they're independent artists or companies to collect their royalties directly from the source okay but it in order for i'm i'm an artist or a producer uh in order for me to benefit of your services i still have to register my tracks with bmi or so you do that through us. So okay. we're the registration service. All right. Right. So our system is a, so you mentioned earlier, I think we both talked about this already, that there's multiple places you have to go to, yeah. right? You can't just go to just BMI and think that you're covered. Um, you have to go to all these different places, depending on the hat that you wear, right? If you're an artist versus a songwriter, if you're a, a label versus a publisher, if you're all four of those things, which I have an ebook that talks about being all four of those things. Um, you know, so depending on the hat that you wear, um, in relationship to any piece of music that you're involved in, you have to know exactly where you should be, um, you know, where that music should be registered. Uh, for example, there's a lot of producers that play instruments, and sometimes they're playing, they're session musicians on people's tracks, and yeah. sometimes, sometimes they're producers on people's tracks. That's two different sources of digital radio royalties, right? One's Sound Exchange, other one's AFM SAG AFTRA. So if you don't understand the difference, based on how you change your contribution but from one track to another, then you, then you might be missing out on royalties. And that happens a lot. Also, sometimes people record on um, 
non-union labels yeah. and sometimes they record with union labels if you don't know if you don't understand what a what a sag after a signatory label is then you're not going to collect royalties when the music is placed on film or tv um or a commercial or if it's um recorded in a certain place so you have to just understand based on what you do in the music business how is the income generated i think everyone understands that if you're in a space for a period of time, you should probably get paid for your, your time there. So you understand that upfront fee, but a lot, the biggest problem is understanding the back end mm -hmm. of, of where all these different desperate kind of places where um, you know, your music or your contribution is generating royalties. Okay. And I think one of the things that, that you mentioned earlier is the difference between ownership versus being a being an income participant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an owner of a piece of work to be an income participant. And if you're an income participant, like a session musician or a background vocalist um, who may not be the owner of the copyright, there's still multiple places where you may be receiving um, copyrights, or right. receiving royalties. So that's what we do every day: is help rights holders understand what was your contribution, where is it distributed or published, and then how, where do you need to have, you know, where do you have to be represented in order to be accounted to and paid out? And then we have all those relationships already. So our software is connected to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, Harry Fox, HFA, I mean, Music Report, Sound Exchange, and so forth. So you're going from one dashboard to deliver your registrations. You're not going to each one of those places okay. after you've you join them once, and then you do all your registrations through us, and then we handle the dispute resolutions and conflict resolutions. So we can consider Tune Registry a one-stop shop for this? Yeah, a one-stop shop for Music Rights Administration but in North America. Going back to... to the prior question, which you touched on, is you still have to join ASCAP or join yeah. BMI mm -hmm. yeah. or join whatever register with these services so you're a member of them before going to a mm -hmm. service like Tune Registry. So let's say you're a guitar player and you just played on a song. Do you need to hope that the rights holder registers it or do you register anything yourself as a performer? Well, um, to the guitar players out there, you shouldn't hope. You should be proactive, <laughs> okay. right? So um, making sure that there's some responsible contact person for that artist, whoever the featured artist is, right? Maybe the manager, yeah. maybe the lawyer who's handling you know, that stuff. But making sure that for session musicians and background vocalists rely heavily on credits. <clears throat> Even in the, today's digital world, credits are still very important. Even though we don't have the album jackets and all that stuff that we used to have to be able to look at credits. Um, so you still need to make sure your credits are being published somewhere. Allmuse.com is one example, Discogs, right. Music Brains. Um, for example, AFM and SAGAFTRA Intellectual Property Rights Distribution Fund works for session musicians and background vocalists, as well as other types of, of, of non-feature creators, um, collecting not only digital radio royalties, but also royalties related to private copy of, 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 of music um, in the U.S. and internationally, uh, record rentals in certain territories where they have uh, um, um, bilateral agreements with, with, with certain countries where they're renting music. Mm -hmm. The session musicians and background vocalists are paid on, the, on that use. Um, vocalists are also paid for, you know, if a song is licensed to a TV show or right. a commercial. Um, so understanding the difference between um, you know, a union track versus a non-union track and whether or not it receives reuse fees and or residuals. Um, so that really depends on the where it was rec recorded. You know, so if it was recorded again with, with a SAG signatory label versus a, a non-union label, and then if the production was union or non-union. Um, and then understanding, you know, the thin line between, you know, being a feature feature performer versus a non-feature performer when you're in like a, um, a uh, you know, various artist work, right. you know, who's the actual, you know, feature performer. <clears throat> so those things we help with every day, right, to help kind of demystify um, what it means to be in the music business and how that directly impacts your royalties. And then we set you up with the tool. We, we are the tool to help you administer your rights when you don't have a publisher and you don't have a label. I see. Me and Bob are both producers yes. other than mixing engineer. And um, so we, we are often in the position of um, working with royalties, mm -hmm. with splitting royalties yes. with, with artists. How a producer would go about it? He would come to yeah. you and you just prepare a contract? Yeah, so... How, how, sorry, no, I reformulate okay. the question. How, we, how, how do we secure 
uh, an artist. Right. Because usually it happens uh, that producers work basically for free, we can say, at, at the beginning of a, of, the, of a music project. They invest on it, they, they put the work in, and then, you know, we split the royalties once the product is out. Well, I think it depends on the project because a lot of times there's the upfront fee. So that all needs to be discussed with the artists that you're working with is what is the upfront producer fee? What are the back end royalties? Is there any ownership share in the master? Um, those types of questions need to be discussed. I put that all in a contract. Okay. And if you know, if you were coming to me as a producer and you're not sure, you're like, well, my fee is X that I charge when I'm, you know, doing someone's, you know, per track. Um, but then we, you said, but I don't know where to go from there. You know, we could have that conversation about what is this project what should the royalty be what is industry standard what is maybe unique to this project um and it happens a lot that just producers and artists don't do contracts and yeah, then it, exactly. it pretty much always ends up badly that's um, why we're um, yeah. doing this today this <laughs> so and then yeah and then they they call me and and if it's the artist they're going my producer's not turning the masters over to me or the producers going, I got screwed. I'm not getting paid anything. Right. Um, so, and it's kind of all over the map now yeah. with where the royalties are going. So, because I think independent producers, a lot of times are cutting their upfront rates to, yeah. and right. try and make it up on the back end, but then they're asking for royalties that are much higher than what a, pro a producer would normally ask for. Um, so it depends on the project, but the important thing is is to have these parameters clearly stated in a contract because then everybody knows this is what's expected. Okay. Whereas if that's if that doesn't happen, it just ends up being a fight yeah. afterwards. This is exactly yeah. why I wanted to do this episode yeah. because it's something that is overlooked so many mm. times. Yes. Well, um, yeah. I was going to cite some examples. I've, I'm producing three projects this year, producing two that have upfront producer fees mm -hmm. and normal size royalties, and then co-producing a project that has no upfront production. It's all uh, just investing, doing in, that but right much now. bigger return on the back right. end should yeah. something yeah. Right. happen. Right. So it's kind of like you wait for your money and it's still an, it's it's an iffy thing yeah but yeah. if it does come you'll get paid more right. than had you gotten a couple grand or five six grand up front exactly for a production right. yeah. fee yeah. sometimes you got to take a gig to pay the bills yeah. Yeah. and you get your production fee and you may not believe in the artist or think the project has you know legs to really get off the ground so that pro from production fee is more important yeah. and the royalties may really mean nothing exactly right. you know and then but to take uh, the artist that I'm co-producing, like we really believe in her, and we could be wrong, and yeah, yeah. the yeah. universe could not accept her. But if it pays off, all this free yeah. time that we're right. investing and in hours and not getting yeah. paid will really pay off. Yeah. yeah. So, on the same subject, yeah. um, you said there are different uh, kind of royalties: mm -hmm. one for the the copyrights of yeah. the song, and one well, for the master composition, composition and master. And master. Yeah. So. As a producer, uh, we can split both? Depends. So if you are also writing on the songs, then I would say, yes, you split the composition okay. royalties as well. However, a lot of producers, again, to make up for the fact that they're not getting so much on the producer fee or back-end royalties, they're saying, well, we get part of the composition too, even though we didn't write yeah. anything. and. You know, from a writer side, that's very difficult for me because it's a, you know, why are you getting writer credit when you didn't write? But of course, if they are writing, then, you know, of course you should get your credit for that. Um, on the producer side, um, then you get, you know, maybe an upfront fee or, and then you get your producer royalty for the masters for the master um, for the master okay. yeah um and then whether you have an ownership share of the master as well is that that's negotiable so. and a question for both um how do you as a producer in order for you to cash in your royalties 
How how do you sign yourself on one of those companies that we talked about before? Well, firstly, you know, some of your royalties are going to be coming from the artist or the label, depending on whether the artist is signed. Um, so that's where the bulk of the royalties are going to be coming from sales and, and that sort of thing. Well, sales is not the bulk of our industry <laughs> anymore, but that's traditionally how it works. Um, but as far as digital performance, that's where sound exchange comes into okay. play. So, yeah, so yeah. let me add a couple of things to those points. Um, cause I, so before I even got into being in the tech space, I managed artists, songwriters, producers, um, and I owned a label and a publishing company. So I've dealt with these deals on behalf of the artist or behalf of a producer. And I think it's important that producers that are listening understand the difference between a producer of a record and a composer of a song. Mm -hmm. um, because we use those terms interchangeably all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that directly impacts, as, as what she was saying, it directly is going to impact whether or not you actually have ownership versus, you know, of the composition versus not having ownership of composition. So the composer has to actually compose the melody and contribute to, you know, what's copyrightable in that sense. So, or, you know, you're contributing to the lyrics, but you don't have to always contribute to the lyrics by writing when we talk about writing, it doesn't necessarily mean writing lyrics all the time. It can be actually composing the melody. Um, so if you're doing that, then you're also contributing to what's the composition that can be, which is copyrightable, um, and that's where the ownership comes in. If you're making a a, a beat off of a bunch of samples and loops and, this and all that, all the time now. <laughs> that's not composing, right? That's, so many people think it is. That, yeah, yeah, that's not being. That's not. Is that not? The beats is not are not um, it's not possible to copyright them. It depends. Like if you're going to these various like splice and different places to to just buy um, loops and uh, um, samples and all that stuff, that's not composing. Okay. Uh, in this in this sense, because the definition of a copyrightable uh, piece is an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. It has to be original first of all. So getting loops and samples that's not original. It has to also be substantial. Um, so, you know, all that together will determine whether you actually are an author of a piece of, of a work that can be copyright protected. So what if you had played the drums, played the bass, and played the keyboards? So no loops, like you, no you samples make, or anything. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're actually making up these on your own, these beats. But no, right? you didn't do the melody yeah. and you didn't do the lyrics. You just did chords and rhythm. So the arrangement it's, is possible to where do, where do you stand yeah, there? Yeah, well, see, we I mean, I've done that where it's like somebody will compose an original beat, yeah. really. I mean, it's still kind of gray, but, um, you know, and then we do a licensing agreement or a purchase agreement um, for that to purchase the rights or license the rights. And, um, you know, so that person, because some of these people are putting them up on sites and it's not exclusive. So then whoever can just right. use it. And from an artist's perspective, I'm like, well, do you want to be using the same backing Being, track yeah. that everybody right. else is using? A lot, a lot, a lot of artists. So, uh, but I want to address yeah. your question because this is very important. So outside of Tune Registry, I'm also a, a lecturer. I teach at UCLA in the musicology department with musicologists. And, and my colleagues are the experts that are brought into copyright infringement cases to differentiate between what's <coughs> copyrightable or not or what sounds like or not and all these things. Right? So I'm surrounded by these people. There is totally a difference between you playing you know, various instruments um, of a melody that you do not write versus you composing a melody, right? That there's... The difference is, is huge. One is a work for higher position and the other is your author, right? So if you did not compose the melody, um, then you're not an, an author of the work. Right. If you play the instruments off of someone else, based on someone else's melody, then you're just a session musician for that particular work. So right, I, range... I think you were saying that you were actually making up that you were actually coming up with this, not just playing something with that the parts. Else wrote. Right, but yeah. he, so so here's the the gray area. Like in Nashville, at least back when I was there in the late mm -hmm. '90s, and some of the uh, older artists, they were very strict that writing is only melody and lyric that was and my chords, next question. Nashville is chords sort of or whatever, and world, beat is too. whatever. Mm -hmm. Nashville it's not, does things a little different. Yeah, also. it it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, you know, warrant. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put it this way because I'm a copyright purist, um, and the you know, it is defined in terms of what is considered a composition, right? right. Playing an instrument of someone else's melody or someone else's idea right. is not a copyrightable sure. um, uh, um, contribution, um, and 
However, that doesn't negate the fact that we have a whole history of fuzzy copyright ownership. Yeah. That you kind of mentioned. <laughs> of people enabling well, copyright ownership just because maybe there's no clarity on who actually is the real author in certain certain cases. I, I had a situation myself as a songwriter manager, going in with my songwriter writing for artists who had ideas but not didn't actually write the lyrics, but they decided they wanted 15, 10%, right? So that happens. Like, there's a politics element to it that's been sure. in business forever. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of this gray area where it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I create, I made all the musical contributions, right, based off of someone else's melody. And then, so now, now I'm a co-author. And we accept that. We've accepted for, for thousands of Ever. tracks. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a, a popular thing, mm -hmm. at least out here in LA, and definitely in the, the urban and pop world, where mm -hmm. the track inspires the top liner yeah. to write the melody. Yeah. So what ends up happening is they do a 50-50 split, right. lyrics, What's melody, 50, and well, the producer and the beat, 50. Right. Mm -hmm. and that's what happened forever. Right. So that's my history in the music business yeah. is, is, is hip-hop and pop. So working with, you know, major label, um, you know, independent songwriters and producers and major label artists um, where, and, and I still preach this, that, that, that mentality, well, the producers half and whoever did the lyrics half. Right. That, and so if there's three people did the lyrics and you guys are splitting the lyrics half, and the two people did the, did the music, then you're splitting the music halves. You know, that's, that's normally how I uh, simplify it. It's just that there's music and then there's lyrics. Right. Yeah. And then there's this thing in between of melody and arrangement. And, and then it gets really uh, uh, fuzzy when you bring in an arranger who's uh -huh. bringing a different contribution to the piece. Uh, like I have a good buddy of mine who does amazing arrangements. Um, but he may not have produced the work or composed the the melody, but sure. he came in and did the arrangement that brought this piece to life, and now he has a like, authorship, you know, contribution. So. I, I think everyone would agree it's yeah. important when you go in with, with if it's your buddies or people you've never met before, before you lay down the first note, have that conversation. Yeah, exactly. Like I know a lot of people like if, if the three of us wrote a song, just be like, hey guys, let's just do thirty three, thirty three, thirty three. Yeah, if you wrote right, more lyrics than career. I did. It's yeah. all good. It's still th going to be... Yeah. It definitely depends there. on where you are yeah. in your career. Um, like, if you're in your career and you're just starting up, you know, you, everyone's putting sweat equity into this. You don't right. know if it's going to be successful or not, and you're just... You're 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 all contributing, and you kind of just... That's the way I approach it. But yeah. then I've had artists who are... Okay, they've been on American Idol, and now they're trying to, you know, get to the next level, and they're a little bit you know, further along in their career because of that exposure. If you have a lawyer, then you'll come to your lawyer and say... What should I do? <laughs> right. Well, it's going to depend on the situation because, like what you were talking about before in urban with the you know half producer half, that's a genre specific custom and practice yeah. really. So, and like I said earlier, Nashville does things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Pop, rock, they're all a little bit different. So it depends what genre you're in. It depends what your status is, um, and it depends what music you're dealing with. Because I also deal with a lot of older music. It was very very traditional to say. Two people, you wrote the lyrics, I wrote the music, 50 50, right. you know, that's it. Or, you know, yeah, three people in a room, it's a third each. Now it's a lot of times more based on the contribution that you make. Okay, well, there's three of us in the room, but, you know, you really contributed like 70% and mm -hmm. you did maybe 20 and somebody else did 10. Right. Um, so it's, it's really on a case by case basis. Um, and I, there's technology for that too, by the way. Now there's technology out there that is actually tracking your actual composite, your contribution percentage wise, and can spit out a recommended split whether you choose to wow. accept it or not. So I'm working with a couple of those companies right now oh, that are cool. being able to track, you know, stem by stem who contributed to this and what does this really make up into the overall production percentage wise. Do you allowed to say any names? No. 